coming to you straight from the Rio Grande and beyond and beyond broadcasting to the four corners of the globe so grab your seat your coffee or your sundowner okay everybody here we go on point as always this is gloves off gloves off So when I was working on Selena, the series for Netflix, um, to play the role of Abraham Quintanilla, I put on a specific amount of weight, which I was fine doing, but also realizing it could be difficult to get that weight off. I got back into my physical regimen with James Leha, but um, I was still having trouble with just those last amounts. And that's when I got to meet Arturo from Laredo Medical Weight Loss Clinic. And just the products that he gave me kind of put me over the edge. I feel great about myself. We're back at you. Um, Paul Buitron, I'm here with a great guest, uh, Sheena Rodriguez with Alliance for a Safe Texas. And we're touching base on stuff that happened and things that are going new. It's ever evolving we're here in Texas and with the state with a crisis, with a migration crisis that we have, everything else. And the things that are looking up to what Texas and the United States will be in the near future. How are we doing today? You doing good? Good. Not enough coffee yet, but uh, we're doing good. So it's been a long few weeks, hasn't it, for all of us, for many of us? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we just came out of a run, a runoff and those people that ran clean campaigns, bravo. Those that didn't, well, you know, those that got elected, congratulations. Those that didn't, you know, uh, we, we congratulate you for standing up for everybody. And that's the main thing. If you, once you signed that dotted line that you're going to run you're making a leap forward in defending the whole community that you where you live so we commend you for that so tell me you what's going on yeah so it's been a it's been a a crazy few weeks of course one of the things you know the runoffs we had them up here too in, in my area and then we had of course the uh republican convention um, so we were, I just got back from that, um, from last week, uh, in San Antonio and, uh, had to hit the ground running to prepare for some upcoming events next week. So, um, yeah, so it's, uh, I'll be making another trip up there to DC, uh, and testifying, um, to Congress next week, next Tuesday, actually. And of course I'll send you the link to the hearing as soon as, as soon as it's up. Um, with regards to the impacts of the, the border crisis has had on our uh, public schools. So. Absolutely. And that's something that many are not paying attention to. And there's a lot of things that are going to happen within our, our schools in the near future. But what, what would you say are the major crisis? What's the major difficulties that we're going to see now? Well, I think there's several different things, and I know I'll be going into some of these things in, in my testimony. Um, of course, the written testimony is always where the meat and potatoes is because we're able to elaborate far more, um, which I'm sure will be up on the congressional website uh, at some point. And I'll probably also put it on our website, securetheborder.us, once it's up um, and official. But then... Um, there's a, there's a lot of different ways that, that we're being impacted. Um, this is not, I, I wish that, the, and this is an area where it doesn't get nearly enough attention with regards to how mass illegal immigration is impacting um, is impacting our communities, every single community. Uh, you know, I talked a lot about the unaccompanied minors. I, that, that's one of the things that I talk about the most, um, is, is, and there's a reason for that because it's something that doesn't get enough attention. And so in the state of Texas alone, when we're seeing over 58,000 unaccompanied minors that have been released to sponsors living and residing across Texas counties, uh, far more than in any other state. And that's just the unaccompanied minors, right? That's not including those that come along with family units um, or those that are accompanied minors. Um, so, because there's really no 
real data. CBP uh, doesn't really break that data down in a, in, in a way that I feel comfortable citing um, as like estimates. But by that, that's why I use that number with the unaccompanied minors the most because it is quantifiable. Um, it is something that is reported on. And so if you even just look at that, the estimates, because by definition, an unaccompanied minor is supposed to be, and I say that because, of course, there's a lot of other issues with that, but it's supposed to be a, a minor that is 17 years or younger. Well, by definition, by state law and federal law, that those are children of school age, right? Um, and so they are required thereby by the Texas Constitution and federal law to then attend school. Now, that doesn't mean that all of them end up in school because some of them, you know, and that that's a whole other issue, right, of, uh, you know, potential exploitation and so on and so forth. But um, by definition, they should be in school. Well, if you look at the number of unaccompanied minors that have been released in the state of Texas since fiscal year 2021, that equates to roughly because the estimates uh, per child per student in the state of Texas for education uh, for a single school year is roughly anywhere between 10 to 18,000 per child per student, depending on who, who you look at, right, for those numbers, but 10 to 18,000. So if you do that math, that is well over $1 billion with a B, just the financial cost of a single year for the number of unaccompanied minors that have been released. Um, and then we're looking at situations where when we are so... Our children, our communities are still feeling the ramifications, the developmental uh, and the educational losses from the COVID, from COVID pandemic, right? With our schools being shut down, uh, the, the online programs were not working out. Um, you know, you, you look into the cognitive delays, the developmental delays, and then the educational delays. Um, you're looking at reading, comp reading and math comprehension um, across the country and across in in, in the United States. Um, of course, it varies a little bit here and there depending on age range and group and things of that nature, but it's roughly about 30% for math and reading comprehension that are performing well below um, the school age, their school level and for Absolutely. their age. And so when you're looking at things like that, and how our communities are still greatly impacted in trying to recover from that. And then you simultaneously flood the country and you flood the school systems in our state with so many, uh, you know, so many that are crossing over illegally into our communities and into our schools. Um, you know, we can't even take care of our own children's educational needs. Um, how are we supposed to be able then to to take care of so many children, many of whom that I've met, uh, many of whom don't even necessarily speak English. They're not even or English or Spanish. Th many of them are not even proficient, proficient, proficient. This um, the proficiency that you were talking about that we our kids are not getting. Well, that's that we know that's a fact. Now, a lot of these kids that are coming in, as you're as you're stating, is many of them are not how can i say they're not proficient in their own in in spanish as per se some of them are speaking other dialects or maybe some indigenous languages from where they come from now we have a problem here especially in some areas in texas with english as a second language um do we have we barely have in some of the some of the other cities teachers that are, what you would call it, that are proficient to teach Spanish as well, both bilingual. So what's going to happen? I'm trying, I'm just looking at this as a huge degradation of our education system and our, of our, of what's going to end up happening in the long run here in the state. Um, the state's going to try to brush off the new teachers that they're going to hire or the new classrooms that they're going to have and everything else. So these school districts, as you know, they're going to try to say, you know what, we need more classrooms. So we need another two buildings to be added. So we're going to raise your all's taxes. And I think that's where this is all leading to. And you know what I'm saying? And um, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a nice little cluster that we're going to get into.
Well, and, and to that point, you know, when we have, like, I, I had my neighbor um, who was an older lady, a widow, a while back that sell her home, too, because p- people can't afford their taxes, right? Absolutely. So, and I live um, in my area, too. It is a very diverse area as well. Perfect. And so, you know, that's another part of that. Yes, we just, you know, I know that the state legislature just delivered you know, some, some huge tax breaks for property taxes. However, I've been saying this for a very long time. We haven't even really begun to see the, and feel the impacts of this border crisis um, in our communities and how much this actually costs, even just the, like dollar wise. Um, and, and, and even more, even more than that, like you said, you know, we are doing our own children, American children, and the migrant children that are going into these school systems a disservice. Why? Because we cannot serve their needs. We cannot even serve our own American children's needs. And the other reality of this is, too, is that you always hear the the administration, the Biden administration, constantly say diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, tell me, when you simultaneously flood our communities in our in our country and our state with millions upon millions of people, let's just erase everything else. Let's just talk about numbers. Let's just look at the numbers. How and they are not moving into affluential neighborhoods. They can't. They cannot afford it. Right? Where are they being dumped in? And where are they, you know, able to 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 go into our communities? already impoverished communities. When I look at Dallas, for example, Dallas County has had over 10,000 unaccompanied minors alone. Again, we're just talking unaccompanied minors. We're not talking family units, right? 10,000. My my husband was born and raised in Dallas. You know how much corruption there is and has been and has always been in Dallas ISD? And, and, and how many of our children in our communities and our schools are already far underserved and underprivileged and cannot properly read or write? I remember when I was just down there visiting with you, right? And we were driving around and you said, you see that one? You said that that's one of the schools that's a, a school to prison pipeline, right? I know what you mean by that, because that's exactly the same thing like it is here in Dallas and in Fort Worth areas, you know, with already impoverished communities. This is where it it is going to impact our children the most. There's nothing equitable about any of that. And so really, this is setting up a disaster for the future of our country and our state and these children. Well, you know, what happens is a lot of these children have already, you know, I'm not talking bad about them. Poor, poor children for being coming over, okay? And let's and a lot. Let's let's play. Uh, let's you know. Let's look at health issues wise. How many of them have brought have all the immunities that we have to go go through? And what's happening here? They're not giving. their and I might be wrong. Correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. You know, have they been immune? Have they been gotten their shots and stuff like that? Because, or what do they have? Vice versa, they might be. We might have this. Our kids might have the vaccines immune to a certain disease, and they bring them in, and all of a sudden, guess what? They get contagious because of something that we're not contagious to anymore, and right. it can affect you know either or. Okay. Well- and that's something that we have to be careful with. That's I'm, that's my those are my concerns. <clears throat> the concerns about the fostering and placing them in houses and stuff like that's a that's another issue that we know how that goes here in the United States. You know, you have some great foster parents, and then you have some that just abuse the system for their own right, and their kids are left out now on their own. Um, then you look at the criminality aspect of the whole situation. You know, we have a lot of gangs. We don't, we're getting them here in Laredo, but Dallas has gangs. Fort Four. Worth has gangs. Yeah. I've been there. I used to teach there, you know, and uh, guess what's going to happen with those kids? They're going to be, they're going to have to fall in line. Either they, some of them might join some, some of these gangs. And so, you know, so, and so that's, those are the things that, people are not looking into. My main concern is their safety, the safety of all kids, period, in general. They're here for a purpose. We can accept them. But 
people are going to start backlashing for we do not have those amenities for our kids. Imagine the needs that are coming in. You know, right. they talk about, they talk about uh, we have great school districts. Yeah. Half of them are school to prison pipeline districts. And the board members could not care one way or another. Okay. Are they really teaching? No. So are we getting our bang for our buck? If we want to put it that way, if I'm, if I'm, is it, is it worth it? Or do we send them somewhere else? You know what I'm saying? Is it worth us paying all these thousands of taxes for these schools that are, our kids cannot get jobs to get out. Mm -hmm. Right. The they can't. You they know cannot. what I'm saying? Yes. And so in, 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 in 2021, um, I actually had a school board president uh, here in the uh, DFW area that reached out to me for a meeting because she wanted to know what I was seeing and hearing because she had seen uh, in the Fort Worth school districts the shift in the gangs. Fort Worth has always had gangs, right? Just like Dallas, just like you said. But she was seeing a dramatic shift in the gangs in the school population that was coming in that was much more violent and she had told me she was like sheena my kids are dying i, I mean nobody's talking wild and this was long before the border got any cover whatsoever so that's also some of the things that i'll be talking about in my testimony um is on how they're targeting our youth right not just even up here in my area in the Carrollton area uh Carrollton isd um, that case is still ongoing with cartel of gang members that were infiltrating and targeting uh, uh, the teenagers to start a drug trafficking ring within the school and several children died. This is not new or exclusive just to hear. Look at what happened in Hayes County when middle school students were being in, in, impacted with fentanyl. It, it is now the, the schools have become a battleground. And when you have the cartel that are utilizing as well, uh, social media and these networks of people that they're infiltrating into the country, um, you know, that are targeting our youth to become smugglers and to, like you said, become members of their gangs. There's so much money to be made, um, and 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 they're it's alluring. It's it's drawing to you know these kids that have no idea. Uh, they're just not fully developed. They cannot uh, comprehend the consequences of their actions. So it, it, it really is even far beyond the financial cost, um, you know, that we talked about, the sheer numbers. But it's also exactly that. The, the, these are different things that are destroying in different areas that is infiltrating into our schools right in our own backyards. And it's making the situations far worse. And how do we combat that? If we are putting Narcan into school districts all across the state, we are already losing. We are losing the battle against fentanyl and opioids. We're losing drastically. Um, we, we are losing our youth. We're, using, we're losing an entire generation. Um, and that, again, on top of what we just came out of the COVID pandemic, how do we recover from this? Um, it, it, it's very disastrous and very ominous. You know, I think, how can I put it? The cr criminal network that's already in place has been there for a very long time. Um, are the cartel bringing them over here and stuff like that? And people say that, yeah, but nobody can ever identify. I have I've asked many and they always say cartel. Identify me which cartel. Mm -hmm. Tell me which one it is, you know? Tell me which gang it is. Oh, no, it's that one. It's kind of like saying, oh, in New York, the mob. Which one of the families? You know what I'm saying? Where? And then you can start picking and choosing. The criminal element's always been around. And I have uh, and I put it this way. You know, Fort Worth's had it. Dallas had it. Irving. Everybody's always had it. It's always been there. The war on drugs, we lost a long time ago. That's right, now we, right now we have, we're, right now what we're doing is just salvaging Oh, you 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 mean the Dare program didn't work back in no. my day? You mean that no. didn't work? <laughs> no, no, my gruff, no, my gruff. You know, and uh, and people are there in that excuse of, oh, we're fighting this for that. We need more money for this. We need more tax money because we're going to fight that. You guys are doing. Are you all really doing it? You know what I'm saying? Are you all really worth the money I'm, we're spending in taxes for your police departments and for education? 
Is that really worth it? Or should we spend it elsewhere? Maybe we should start pri making a private corporation, sending our kids to private school for them to get educated. Maybe we should start telling the police, you know what? Maybe we should hire this company over here that does security, that does it a lot better than you all, and we give them the ability instead of you guys, which you guys are basically not doing anything, just abusing the power that you all have. You well, know, we have school districts in there that, that, that are stronger than some of these cities. You know, I mean, the, you know, you have a city like, say, Bedford or Euless, uh, and uh, you have the school district that's, that encompasses a whole county. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, they have more police officers than they do. Yeah, you but the, that goes to the point of these, these issues, yes, while they have always existed, it's free reign. It is absolutely free reign now. There's no, but it's, it's incentivized. And to your point, even before about the criminal elements and, and, and the healthcare concerns, it's similar. I mean, it's the same thing. We don't know who's coming over. They, I, I can tell you firsthand, and I've seen this and I, I have so many of, I've documented it. They're not coming over with identification. When people come over illegally, it is nearly impossible to in, to effectively bet who they are. It's not like they're willingly, they're throwing their documents away. And it's the same thing with these children. So many of the children that I've encountered have no documentation whatsoever. And how many, you cannot compare an average 16-year-old, uh, you know, te American teenager to a 16-year-old from some of these other countries, Venezuela, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, it's, uh, it's a far different environment. How many of them have gang affiliations like the unaccompanied minor who came through illegally uh, across the border and went up there through, through the unaccompanied minors program, was released to a sponsor in Maryland, and then as soon as he got out, um, ended up busting down the door and brutally raping and murdering with a, a cell phone charger cord um, a 20-year-old autistic woman, right? That's real with MS-13 gang affiliations. And there's so many other, I mean, the, the idea too that MS-13 would now no longer be looked at as one of the most violent uh, gangs that are coming over right now, you have so many others, is, is mind-blowing to me. And especially with the unaccompanied minors, we don't know who they are. How many of them are actually adults? Like the one that was released to a sponsor, came through Texas, went through our facilities, was released to a sponsor in Florida, and then he turns around and brutally stabs and murders his sponsor that was actually a 24-year-old male. And, and bragged to his mother the entire time... Oh. OK, my, my phone's about to die and bragged to his mother the entire time that he was lying and he, he was getting a free ride. Right. These are how many of those are going into our school districts because there's no way to vet them. You know, and, and you're going to have people on the other side that are going to say that's that's a very small percentage. It's a very small percentage that's coming through. What's the, um, what's the numbers of undocumented children that we have here in the state? Well, as of right now, it's over 58, 58,000 unaccompanied minors. But again, that's just the unaccompanied minors that that does not. There's no way to really, truly quantify how many have come over um, in other in other areas, like in, in other numbers. Sorry, I'm trying to plug in my phone charger cord so that it doesn't drop. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of technical difficulties, but that's where I'm using that 58,000 unaccompanied minors so far. I understand. Okay. We're going to make this work. <laughs> I'm doing fine. Um, but, you know, see, that's, you know, now everybody's going to say, well, that's not, that's not happening. It's not not all of them are coming in here that they, they don't have drug affiliation. They're not that way. OK, what's you know, so. Uh, so well, what's the number that's acceptable? My response to then is what is the number that is acceptable? Number one, we don't know. We don't know how many do. And that should be terrifying. Right. Number two, what is that number that is acceptable? How many, it could quantify that for me, right? Because then the response is always going to be, we don't know what we don't know. And if you're going to tell me that even one person 
is acceptable to come over and kill like a 20 year old innocent American woman, you know, and being brutally raped and murdered. Um, tell that, tell their parents that that was an acceptable number. I, I, I get, I mean, I get what you're, you're coming from and we do not have the, the ability, but when you look at what, 58,000, let's say a thousand of them are hardened criminals that are in here. You know what I'm saying? So that's a, a thousand hardened criminals that we're left into our streets and into our schools. And we better be careful with what we have. We get to a thousand, you know, and so we have to be a little bit better than what's happening. We have to understand that a little bit more. Uh, you know, um, what's going to happen, what I see, what I'm, I'm foreseeing is they're going to push back and they're going to bring in more. And, uh, they're, and they're not going to know what to do with it. People are going to get overly tired. Our school districts are right now collapsing with many different facets that's going on. So eventually our school districts are, are going to end up being taken over by the state. And the state's going to say, this is what you all do, period. And um, maybe it's be a good thing because we won't have all the, the issues that we have right now with corruption with also a lot of these boards that we have. Right. I oh, know no. that area there your isd has been riddled with it just like dallas yeah you know what i'm saying so maybe that'll be a good point that we don't have that corruption element inside the uh, public officials anymore now we just have we just have to deal with the state agency who knows maybe it'll be a little bit better but um it's what what gets me is the violence is going to continue it's going to get worse and the, the violence people are not seeing it is you have you have people that have come in with a type of sense of defense that they come in because how many some of these let's say Venezuela how many countries did that person from Venezuela have to cross over to get to Texas several mm -hmm. he crossed over at least five different different uh, countries well, and there's a good portion of them that are not coming from Hispanic from Hispanic countries either I've met people from Senegal. Congo, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Russia, uh, so like literally all over the world, the Chinese, um, you know, a, a lot, a lot from all over the world. Uh, and that's why I'm saying many of them, for, despite the different dialects that we're both cognizant of, in Spanish language, you're talking about countries from all over the world. And we are expected, by we, I mean the Texas taxpayers in our school, are expected to meet the needs of the world's children and to meet them where they are when we don't know where they are. We don't know where they are uh, educational, developmental wise. We can't even speak to them in many different ways. And then it is blatant discrimination when, cause you mentioned it before, even like with the vaccines and everything. I had one child that went through public schools another child that I homeschool, right? Um, and so, we are we as American citizens and our children are held to different standards. We have to show vaccinations. Um, we have to show the if we go from one school district to another, we have to show all of that documentation of, of, of their educational history. Or we have to also show exemptions for vaccines. Um, if we have that, like we have to jump through hoops and bounds that many of these individuals are not held to. It is blatant discrimination against American citizens, in my opinion. No, you're correct. You're correct. But let me, you know, uh, when do you go? When do you go to con Congress, and when are you going to go testify? So I'm leaving on Monday, um, and then because uh, I got to get there a little early, and then I'm set to testify uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday morning at 10:15 Eastern Standard Time, and I'll make sure that I post those links um, whenever they have that information available uh, where people can watch the, uh, the the hearing live because I think and and there's going to be um, individuals from various areas across the country. Um, and so I think that it's going to bring uh, different perspectives of how the different areas um, are being impacted. And, and I think, again, uh, I hope that it's going to be very informative for for, you know, for Americans to be able to hear this and consider the different ways that our public schools are currently being impacted and what the long term ramifications of these things are going to be um, so that we can hopefully try to address some of these issues, even here on the local level. Absolutely. You see. The problem that we have, the, the problem that I'm seeing is I've yet to see a solution. And the, the main thing people are going to say is, oh, well, we can hire more teachers. 
Yeah, but we have to pay those teachers. Yep. And, and we can we can, yep. we can build we can build more schools. We have to you're gonna raise our taxes to build more schools. You see that and that's what happens. And then everything else goes through and the that nice little corruption tactics come in through the constructions and so on and so forth. I mean, just a money making sometimes I sit back and I look I tell myself, you know what? I think that's what this is all is. It's just a money making scam for my dear friend over there that has a air conditioner company that that puts in air condition in all the schools and and he's the one that's gonna have the contract for it and he can just write the contract or whatever he wants because we're gonna use them anyway. And well and just you know, to that, put that, yeah, just just to put that into perspective, right? We talk about building new schools. Let's just put this into perspective. Um, in my county alone, we've had over 2,600 unaccompanied minors. Again, just unaccompanied minors alone, right? That's it, because that's the only stats that I feel comfortable sharing. 2,600. That is the population of four elementary schools in my district. Four elementary schools. That is the entire student population of Trinity High School where I graduated from. I mean, like, these num these are not these are not little numbers you know that we're talking about. This is not a small uh, a percentage that we're talking. And, and you said it before. This is going to continue. The federal government has codified or made permanent their uh, their policies, their dangerous policies with regards to the children. Um, and so, no, we 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 barely just begun. This is going to be continuing for quite some time until um, unless uh, things change on the federal level um, to, to, to stop incentivizing children. And like children shouldn't even be a factor in this. It's, it's, it's insane. So yeah, but. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we wanna thank you for sharing what you've seen and, and this point of view that's not around, not many people are looking at it, but it is something that affects everybody. And let's see what, what solutions we can come in. And maybe next time we talk about this, we can talk about some solutions that we can start looking into and see which way we can go. Because, uh, you know, right now we're, we're talking about a problem that's existing, but we need to also find out a solution for that problem. And the solution is not just printing more money because we have to pay for it anyway. And uh, if they say, oh, we need to pay more, more schools here, more schools are going to be built, and all of a sudden everybody's taxes go up. That's not a solution, but that's what's going to be forced upon. And we have to find out, see how it's going to be done. I don't know. Right. Right. More bonds, more bonds, bonds. That's what I see in the future. So, yeah. But thank you so much for having me on. And again, I'll post the information once we have it available. And uh, in, of course, after the hearing as well, I'll also have that up on our social media and our website, securetheborder.us. It's always Absolutely. a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. And we'll see you soon. Until next time, you all, you all stay safe, be safe, and God bless you. Until next time.